Good morning, Christ community. How are you all doing this morning? Great. Well, in case you don't know, my name is Stephen Robeson. I'm a student ministry director here. And before we begin, just want to throw in a couple quick extra announcements. One is, Pastor PJ mentioned a new life group is forming. And if you have students uh, during second service, we are going to gather as a group over here, so there will always be a place for them to sit and to hear the sermon. And so if you're excited about joining that life group but have a student that would then be alone in second service, they won't be anymore, so please join us. We'd love to have them sit with us. You can let me know or just let your students know. Also, we are doing a student retreat this year, uh, May 14th through the 16th. And there is a serving opportunity that I just wanted to plant in, in any of you that, that feel called to serve. We are looking for servers to serve meals. And so if you are willing to do that that weekend, if you could reach out to me as well as Summer Chancellor, and you can get her information in our um, church directory, or you can just come to me and I'll, I will connect you. But that would be a great blessing for our students as we are going to spend that weekend really focusing on the Word of God, our lamp for life. And so this morning, we have a lot to go through. Um, before we begin, though, I'd like to just lift us up in some prayer. So if you would bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, we just come before you today. I just pray that your word would penetrate our hearts. I just pray that the Spirit will move us, God. We just lift up this time to you. We're so thankful to be able to come together and to worship you and to grow closer to you this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, this morning we are going to be looking at Psalm 51, and this psalm is written by David, and we have, if you've been with us for the past several weeks, there's been a few psalms where David has written, and, and this one is, is similar, and it's dealing with sin, and it's dealing where David is confronted by a trusted advisor, his name is Nathan, and this psalm really is a plea it's a plea for mercy, forgiveness, and ultimately redemption. And so we're going to start this morning, we're going to go through three major parts. First, we're going to look at a life that has such a faithful beginning. A man with a heart after God, with a strong and incredible faith. But later, we're going to see where horrible sin comes into play. Choices are made that causes destruction among his family. The consequences of these choices that lead to a rebellion. But through all of this, we're going to see that David, and importantly this morning, all of us, we have a promised Redeemer who can cleanse us from this sin, can blot out our transgressions, and can remove our iniquity. So I'm going to spend some time really taking you to where David was at when this psalm was written. It's really important for us to get to the place that where he was when this psalm he reads, and so I want to set a couple things up for you this morning, two kind of major camps that maybe we're sitting in, or for some of us, we're in between, and there may be a camp, there may be some of you this morning where we've had such a faithful beginning in life. Maybe we came to know the Lord at a young age, we put our faith in Him, we read our Bible, we go to church, we we trying to do the will of God, and that's an incredible moment. So some of you may be in this faithful life at this moment. Others, on a flip side, may be ensnared in sin, or may have lived through difficult sin, maybe, maybe self-inflicted, or others as a family inflicted, and be deep within that and know the guilt and the destruction that it caused. And we're going to see two sides to this coin this morning. And then all of us may fall somewhere in between going through life, trying to live a life of faithfulness to God, but dealing with different sin in our lives. And this is a good reminder this morning that our flesh, that our fleshly desires are at war with our, the Spirit of God. And I want to take you to a verse this morning just to set a few things up. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, we read, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in constant conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Now there's two things I want to draw your attention to. One is, and this message is primarily for a follower of Christ this morning, but if you are a follower of Christ, you have been given the promised Holy Spirit. 
And this is a really good thing because the Holy Spirit is going to wrestle and convict you and war against your fleshly desires so that you don't do whatever you want. That's a very positive thing because we're going to see this morning that when we let our fleshly desires take run, it is very destructive. The other thing I want you to take point is we need to recognize there is a spiritual battle occurring every single day. That it's not just when we plan to do a mission trip or we go to do a major ministry event that we see spiritual warfare. If we are paying attention, we are going to see that the warfare is daily. And this really brings it. We are at war. And it's not there's the fleshly war with ourselves and our desires, as well as we have an enemy, Satan, who is always looking to destroy us. So in short, I want to pray this morning that God will wake us to be on guard. Whether you're in a faithful position and you're going to see what can be done through redemption if you're struggling with sin, but know that this battle is taking place. And thankfully, we have the hope of Jesus Christ, which we're going to see this morning, that provides redemption. So I want to start now and and show you this faithful beginning of David. Now, King David, most of you, maybe a lot of you know the story of King David. It's very famous. I'm going to spend some time just going through this for a moment. He, at age 15, was known as a shepherd boy, and he was anointed by God at this point. Now, to set this up, at this time, Israel, just before this point, they wanted to have a man as their king. And so Samuel, the prophet at this time, was, was distraught by this. And God said, look, they want a man as a king and they want to replace me. I will give them what they want, but there's a consequence. A man as our king is going to make laws. He's going to tax you. He's going to have slaves. He may send you out to war. And so the people of Israel, they saw the other nations and they wanted this. And so God gave them Saul. But Saul was disobedient and there was a, there was a consequence And so God was removing him from being king over Israel, and he was anointing David. And David was anointed at age 15, and later on he becomes king at age 30. And he's known as one of the greatest men in the Old Testament. Also famously, obviously, the ancestor of Jesus, the lineage through which Christ comes. And a very famous story that maybe all of you have heard, David and Goliath, the giant killer. He's also the eighth son of Jesse. And David, if you look at his life early on, it's one of humility. He's loyal to God. He has such great faith in God. He's called a man after God's own heart. And I want to go through a couple verses on a man where we see this called out in Scripture. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, we see here, But now your kingdom will not endure. And this is referring to Saul, as I just mentioned. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. And so we see Saul being rejected by God and being being removed as king. And we see David here being, being anointed. And then in Acts chapter 13, Paul gives such a good, good fleshing out of what it means to be a man after God's own heart. He says, In chapter 13, verses 21 and 22, he says, After this, God gave them the judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. See, God, David followed God's will. His focus was to serve God and do as he had been commanded. And there's a great story of David's amazing faith early on. And that's David and Goliath. And a lot of times when we look at the story of David and Goliath, we think about him slaying the giant, how great that is. But something is greater than that story. And I want to go through that for just a few minutes this morning and set it up. The Philistines and the Israelites are mortal enemies. History, at least 13 times they had conflict and war. And in the case of David and Goliath, you had the Philistines up on one hill, you had the Israelites up on another, and you had this plain in between. And Goliath 
who is the champion of the Philistine army, towering nine foot, nine inches, almost 10 feet tall, having armor and gear that weighs almost 200 pounds, which is probably more than what David weighed at the age of 15, he steps out into that plain and he challenges the Israelites. Winner take all, one on one. I'm the champion of the, of the Philistines. Give, bring, your, bring your champion of the Israelites and the winner takes all. And you may think, okay, well, now we know the story. Next thing up, David comes. But something happens first. Forty days goes by. I want you to think about that for a minute. Put yourself in, in the Israel army. This challenge is put out, and 40 days goes by. At some point, if you're in that army, you're probably having the thought process of, should I go out? Should I be the champion? Should I step out in faith and defend the honor of God's army. And so 40 days goes by and no one steps forward. And then David comes. Now I want you to also put your shoes in David. How many of you are younger than 15 this morning? One. So then how many are older than 15? Okay, so put your shoes back to where you were when you are 15 years old. Okay, he's a shepherd. He's not in the army. His dad tells him to take food up to, the, up to the camp, and he goes up there, and he asks what's going on, and he gets told what's happening. And he realizes that this, this Philistine is defying God. And he goes to Saul and says, your servant will fight him. Now, Saul immediately says, you, you know, you're not, you're not a soldier. But David has incredible faith. Think about this. You're 15 years old. The equivalency of this is like taking a high school football team and putting them up against the New England Patriots. They're never going to win on their own accord. They're never going to win. This man was a champion, a champion that doesn't lose, that fights for a living, that towers over him. David isn't going to defeat Goliath on his own. And David's incredible faith says to Saul, the king, I will, def I, will, I will be delivered. God will deliver me. He delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. He will surely deliver me from the Philistine. Do you have such faith that we can say we will surely be delivered by God? And that is what David does in this moment. And the rest is history. He goes out and it happens. It's an incredible life that had such great faith. But this isn't the only life of David. Now he becomes king, and he's king for 40 years. And he's known as a great king, and a man after God's own heart, and we saw that clearly in the story of David and Goliath in his early lifetime. But he's also known as a few other things. A betrayer, a liar, an adulterer, and a murderer. And I want you to think about that for a moment. We have on one side a man of such great faith in God, and on the other, doing terrible things that we probably wouldn't even want this person next to us. We would want them thrown in prison, or put away for the rest of their life, or sent to execution. But in the scenario of David, he's king. How quickly things can change. And David's choices here in his, it's about 10 to 15 years into his, his kingship, it causes great family destruction. And it causes a rebellion. And so turn with me this morning to 2 Samuel chapter 11 as we really pull apart this destruction that occurs. This horrible sin that we see play out. So, <clears throat> 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. Now, I prefaced, you may be this morning in a position, in different positions in life, in different faith, where you're at with God this morning. I want you to think about this. You know, getting up and going out on your patio or going for a walk or going out on a deck isn't inherently a bad thing. 
There are going to be choices in life, some pursued. Sometimes we pursue our flesh and go looking. Other times, these things come into our view. And we see here in Scripture, you know, David just went up, and if, if the Scripture stopped there, there's nothing wrong. He went out to sit on his patio. But you're going to see where David is given now a moment to make decisions. He has choices to make, and he has to make them quickly. So from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. A choice is made. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. He finds out who she is, and then another choice is made. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Another choice is made. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. And then another choice is made. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. Now Joab is his military leader. It's his commander-in-chief. And David has Uriah over for a while. And further on we read, he says, Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with them, and David made him drunk, another choice that is made. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell over. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. So we see premeditated murder. And we see the progression where each time a choice was made in sin, and it grew and grew and grew, and we know that sin, when played out in full, leads to death. And in this case, it led to this man's death. And we're going to see great destruction beyond this that comes. And I want to point you to, we read through this, we don't think about Joab. Joab, commander-in-chief, he has to work for the king. He's put in a really bad position. He had the letter that says, put him out and have him killed. He knows it's murder. And he does it. He also sins in this moment. He gets put in a bad spot. And the effects of David's choices put other people in spots to sin, and they choose poorly as well. And so destruction is coming clear fold for us this morning. Now things are going to turn a little bit. And we're going to see a great example of how a trusted advisor, somebody close to us, can come before you and bring your sin to light in a way that is lovingly so it can be dealt with. And David has a trusted advisor. His name is Nathan. He's also a prophet of God. God speaks to Nathan. And, and then Nathan delivers the word. And so I want you to write down in your notes this morning, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. This is a great section of, pas of, of passage to go through and to really look at how Nathan confronts David. We're not going to spend much time in it this morning for the sake of time, but what I want you to key in on is Nathan doesn't walk right up to David and call out his sin in broad daylight. What Nathan does is Nathan presents an example to David, looking, understanding who David is, and David comes to the conclusion that this example he had pre presented to him that person deserved to die. And then Nathan says, that person is you. So he walks him correctly to understanding what he had committed. Then Nathan speaks the word of God. So we see God working through him. We see the Holy Spirit. And this is God's word that Nathan is speaking. Listen to this in verses 7 through 12. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if this had all been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, 
and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. See, God is calling out David's sin. Now, this is another really important moment. So we've seen David, who has a great life of faith, and then choices come front and center, and making decisions of great sin, horrible sin, and the pain it causes, even to the point of murder. But now we have such a clear moment. His sin has been brought to his forehand. God has, has spoken to him. And David says to Nathan, he says, I have sinned against the Lord. He recognizes that he has sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replies, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die but because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. And his family destruction is great. Let me recap some of it for you this morning just to, to bring home how devastating it can be. So Ammonon, David's firstborn, he rapes Tamar, who's within the family. And then Ammonon is murdered by Absalom, David's third son, as revenge for what Amnon did. David's unnamed son dies shortly after birth, just as God said would have happened. And his fourth son is executed by Solomon. And that's just some of it. Now think about that. Some of us may have lived through some tough times in life. Maybe you're resonating with some of these things in our own ways. But this is pretty, pretty uh, disastrous. Was David thinking about the ramifications of his choices when he stepped out on that patio. And all the way along, he had decisions where he could have turned back to God. First, when he found out who the woman was, he could have turned back to God. Second, when he committed adultery, he could have turned back to God. And he continued on. But at a critical moment, and this is why David is a man after God's own heart, he was confronted with his sin, and he recognized that he has committed sin. And we also see a rebellion occur. So not only is the family killing itself, and it's just self-destruction, and that we have other people outside the family that have been destroyed, his own son leads a rebellion. In chapter 15 of 2 Samuel, we read, Then Absalom sent secret messages throughout the tribes of Israel to say, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then say Absalom is, is king in Hebron. 200 men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. They had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. And so the conspiracy gained strength, and Absalom's following kept on increasing. A messenger came and told David, The hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials, Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. So as you can see, sin always has consequences. Sometimes it's unseen. In this, in this instance, it's very well seen and recorded. But this is where David's at this morning. Psalm 51. Really want, to, want you to think about the choices we make and the destruction it can cause. Some of us may have been through some really difficult stuff. And this is where David's at. His family is destroying itself. He's watching his own sons kill each other. It would be very difficult to lose a son shortly after birth. I could only imagine having three children. How difficult this would be to watch your children kill each other. This is where he's at in Psalm 51. But David also has a repentant heart, and we're going to see that. So turn your Bibles to Psalm 51. And let's read where David's at this morning. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, 
Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of your bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my, lo- word, open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in the burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. You know, as you can imagine, as David's writing this psalm where he's at this morning, and maybe you have something you've done or been a part of that you don't want anyone to remember. I mean, God, when he says, blot out my transgressions, David is calling out for it to be remembered no more because his sin is always, he's being reminded continually of his sin. And while the world doesn't always forget and we don't forget, God can redeem us. He is our promised redeemer. And we're going to see this, that he has the power to remember no more. And he tells us in Isaiah, in Isaiah 43, verse 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Those who come to Jesus Christ, when we repent, when we confess our sins, he has the power to wash it away and remembers no more. And repentance, when we say the word repentance, think about David. It's going, I'm wrong. I have sinned against you, God. Your ways are right. My own ways are wrong. It's acknowledging that our ways are not his ways. And we are to follow God. We are to trust in him. We are to say, teach me and cleanse me and purify my heart so I will go your way. And turning from that, What we see is David is recognizing here, I have sinned against the Lord, and he's turning back to God. Look again at David's response. It's blatant. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says, and this is where God knows our heart, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. This is so important to understand. Because the world will change its opinion on what is wrong and what is right. Oh, two consenting adults, if they do it in private, none of our business, it's okay. It's so interesting to know where we want to put a man in charge and create rules and follow it. The Israelites wanted it. We desire it. Sometimes it's ourselves or others. But David's recognizing that when we sin, we're sinning against God. No matter what the world says. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And in Job chapter 14 we read, Mortals born of women are few of days and full of trouble. They spring up like flowers and wither away. Like fleeting shadows they do not endure. Do you fix your eye on them? Will you bring them before you for judgment? Who can bring what is pure from the impure? No one. 
See, we cannot purify ourselves. Do not be deceived. We can only be redeemed through the power of Jesus Christ. We just went through this on Easter. We can only be redeemed because Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and was resurrected three days later. And he's eternally alive. And that eternity provides the cleansing when we believe in him. You ever hear or maybe even thought, you know, I just try to do more good than bad. We can only be redeemed through Jesus Christ. We cannot earn it by trying to do more good than bad. And David says, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior. What bloodshed he had on his hands, both outside of his family and in in his family. But that guilt, does it lead us back to Jesus? Guilt should lead us back to the cross. And when we come to him, our promised redeemer, we see that there's a response. That when David came back to God, he had a response. And we can see what God God desires and what he gives us. David says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and a steadfast spirit. A calling to purify him. And we read in 1 Peter, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. See, God purifies our soul. We can have sincere love when we're following Christ. And and through obedience to the truth, the truth of who Jesus is. In a firmly fixed place, which which is the meaning of steadfast. So when we have a steadfast spirit, that means we're fixed. It's not going to move. We need to have a fixed place in Christ. David goes on to stay, say, Restore my joy that came through salvation. Now some of you may remember your testimony, that moment in life. Maybe the weight of the world was on you. You were dealing with troubles and tribulation. And you came to know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You came to know that your sins are paid for and you've been cleansed. And you just have this moment of just the the weight of the world's lifted. And you realize that you have an eternity with God. That no matter what happens in this world, you know where you're going to be. And it's amazing. It's an incredible experience. And David's calling out to God to restore him to that joy. To take us back to that moment. And he says, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. God can give us the willing spirit. And that willing spirit is obedience. Obedience to Christ. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. He says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. See, We look at the world and it's to do things for joy. We're always trying to do things for joy. And we look at rules and we try to change them. But here you see that when you follow God's commands and you keep Jesus' commands, it's a joy that is unparalleled. David began his early life with such incredible faith. It's one that's been told for thousands of years. We all have heard it, I'm sure. The greatest king in Israel and the lineage through which Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, would come through. But while he had great faith, he wandered away. He made bad decisions. He followed his fleshly desires. And he committed horrible sin. But know this. Our Lord is greater than than any destruction we can achieve. And redemption is always available. Listen to 2 Peter. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God desires us all to come to repentance. 
And David came to repentance. And God forgave his sins. And David's response is one of faith. Listen, then, and David is responding in this psalm, he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. See, we need to lay it down. We need to take our sin to God. And this promised Redeemer, He blots out our transgressions. He washes them away. And then we respond as David is responding. You know, Jesus said, said to His disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So you have Jesus telling us to do this. David saying, I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. And we just read how God desires that everyone would come to repentance. We need to respond in faith. We need to teach others Jesus' ways and his commandments and sing of his righteousness and declare his praise. So no matter where you stand today, whether it's a faithful beginning, we need to be continuing in that faith. Or if you're deep in guilt and shame, confess your sins. Come before the Lord. Trust in Jesus. You know, I want to just real quick pull up. We talked about David. There's another man in Scripture that we read about. His name is Joseph. And he was confronted with a very similar choice. When he was working for Potiphar, Potiphar's wife came before him and wanted to commit adultery. And Joseph had a choice. And he ran. He ran. Now, he was thrown in prison for full disclosure, but God was always with him. He made the right choice, and God was always with him. We have choices every day that are in front of us. Some pursued and some unpursued that present themselves. We have decisions, and they do matter. But no matter what, no matter what, God redeems all who come to Jesus, who confess their sins, declare him Lord and Savior. And we have a future hope with eternity with him. Let's bow your heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you just that we're able to go through your message. I pray for all of us to just confess our sins, Lord, and to respond in faith by serving you faithfully, by following your commands, by teaching others about you, Lord. I just pray that we will continue to grow closer to you each day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.